Thank you very much for the reading of Scripture and our, our thoughts at the uh, communion table today. I um, <clears throat> want to welcome uh, all of our guests that are with us today, and uh, we're really glad you're here. For those that are with us online, uh, we're also glad you're joining us, and we pray that you also are uh, receiving a blessing from our time today. Um, we're going to be looking in, in this passage, actually, that we read. This will be where we're going to sort of launch our study today. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the idea of Jesus being a way maker. Um, and uh, we're going to consider Jesus himself today. And then in subsequent uh, studies, we're, we'll look at how God can overcome overwhelming odds to help us in our lives of things that were impossible before uh, under our own strength. And so uh, we're uh, uh, going to enjoy, I think, this study. Uh, there'll be some challenges in it and uh, some encouragements as well. Uh, it's great to be back with you all. We uh, had beautiful weather coming down today. Um, a little fog, uh, but uh, we had, a, we had a, a good visit. Got out of the car here fresh air. Awesome. You know, got to, got to get that fresh air while we're here. Uh, so we, uh, we have really enjoyed that. You know, uh, it's been a, an interesting week, uh, at, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, and I, I want to share, I'll share a little bit about what I'm thinking here as we get into this study, but let's bow together for a word of prayer. God, thank you that we are free Thank you that we live in a country that we can open your word, that we can meet together. Lord, we come today in humility. We, we know uh, were it not for you, we, we would be nothing. We thank you for making a way for us to know you and to have salvation. Lord, we thank you and ask that you would bless each heart, touch each one with your spirit, and the reading and preaching of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in, in John uh, chapter 14, we, we're going to look here a little bit. And, and one of the things, when we talk about Jesus being a way maker, uh, we're going to uh, talk about why he's a way maker. And uh, that, that's really the first part of our, uh, our study today. What is it about Jesus that makes him a way maker? Well, I think, you know, before we talk about ways that, that the Lord can make us and, and help us, if you will, um, we'll talk about the way. And, and what we're going to see in this study is that the reason Jesus can be a way maker is because he is the way. Therefore, he is ultimately qualified to be a way maker if he is himself the way. And so as we look at this passage, uh, we, we think about this, that, that, you know, the disciples, now Jesus is, he's about to close out his ministry. He will soon be at the cross. And so he is with his disciples, and he is now recapping. He is now reassuring. He is now promising them. He's letting them know that, that yes, I'll be going, but it is to your advantage that I go, because I will send the advocate who will come and help you and guide you. And so he's, he's touching on extremely important things. And one of the things that we see is that his disciples, even after this time, did not understand exactly what was going on. It had been spelled out several times before. And yet right here at the end, they're still wondering, what do you mean uh, you're going to the Father? And, and these kinds of questions. And I don't know about you, but I find an odd sense of encouragement. That after this time, Jesus' disciples didn't quite understand. You know, that encourages me when I don't understand all the scriptures. You know, we like to know everything. We like an answer for everything. And yet, we have to, as we walk with the Lord, we study, we learn, we grow. And even after years, believe it or not, there are things we still don't understand. Can I get an amen on that? Right? We know just because we've been around a long time and read a lot of Bible, that doesn't mean that we understand uh, everything or that we cannot gain new insights into these things. And so, uh, as Jesus is, is interacting with his disciples, you know, Thomas 
uh, is, is asking this question. Uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? So Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place. Thomas says, We're, we, don't, we don't know where you're going. Where's this place going to be? And, and then Jesus, of course, says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so then he goes on, and, and Philip uh, begins to ask him further in this dialogue, uh, you know, different questions the disciples are, are, are starting to uh, think about and understand. But one of the things that Jesus wants very clear, and it was very clear to them, is that he is the way. He's not one of many ways to the Father. He is the way to the Father. And I think it's, it's significant for us because as we look to our own personal faith, you know, we ask, what is the foundation of our faith? And our faith rests in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died, he rose again, and he is able to, be, for that reason, make a way for us to salvation. We have no forgiveness outside of Jesus Christ. Today, there is this sort of quasi-philosophy like, well, you know, I'm not anti-Christian, but, you know, aren't, aren't all roads going to the same place? Um, I, I, uh, in our midweek Bible study a little ways back, I was talking to a person, and, and uh, we had a really great Bible class, and afterwards he came up and he said, uh, hey, I wanted to know, I belong to this religion, but don't you think that this religion is on par with or as important or can provide the salvation that we find in Christianity. He said, because really we all worship the same God, don't we? And I, I said to this young man, no, we don't all worship the same God. A knockoff brand of Christianity is not Christianity. Other world religions that promise salvation without Jesus Christ being at the center of it cannot answer the most significant problem we have, and that is the forgiveness of sins. Only Jesus can forgive sins. Yes, you can, we can offer prayers, and, and you know we can subscribe to different kinds of things, but at the end of the day, there is only one way. And I pray today that we will not forget that. That we will not be drawn into this quasi, it's all good, we're all going the same place, you know, it's all one or another. It doesn't really matter as long as we try to be good. Have you ever heard that? It doesn't really matter as long as we try to be good. Well, what's interesting is, I don't know if you've tried to be good. And you know what else? If you've tried, you realize how miserable we are at being good. Because when I'm good, it's, it's my own standard why I'm good. Or it's because you're worse than me. That's why I'm better. I'm doing good because I can look down on you. No, no, no. The message was always clear. You know, there are people who say, well, Jesus never claimed he was the Son of God. What in the world? You know, people, you, you think he never claimed he was the Son of God? Or the only way to salvation? You know what? We just got to get the good book open. Jesus claimed that he was God. He told the Jewish leaders that before Abraham was, I am. Meaning he is Jehovah God. There was no mistake in Jesus' mind who he was. And you know what? There was no mistake in his disciples' mind who he was. And he was about to go to torture and death, and he would rise again to prove that he is the way the truth, and the life, and he is the way that we can come to salvation. Now, think about when Jesus' ministry, you think about some of the people that he reached out to and offered salvation and hope. Uh, you know, I was just, you know, you can think of many more than these, but I, I think, you know, remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a religious leader who was ashamed and came to Jesus at night because he wanted to find out and, and talk to Jesus. So, so you know, this is, there's hope for everyone to become a Christian, even arrogant, religious, rich people. But you know what? There was the woman at the well where Jesus, he broke all tradition. He broke down religion, and he came with salvation. 
And so this woman who was, uh, in, in, as we have read in John and talked about, she was kind of disinterested, a little cynical. But you know what? That didn't matter because the message of salvation is not just for the religious. It's for everyone. Everyone deserves a chance. Everyone should be able to hear uh, the message. Uh, you remember the rich man that ran up to Jesus. He said, Lord, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I, I've done all these things since I was a kid. And, and Jesus said, hey, ju I, I just want one thing. Go sell everything you have. And then come follow me. You know what? He turned around and left. He didn't, it, because there was no playing games. There, there was no, oh, yeah, Jesus, I'm, I'm a good person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I want to have eternal life. Jesus says, go sell it all. And by the way, you notice that Jesus didn't want his money. He didn't say, go sell it all and send it in. Drop it in the gunny sack and I'll pray over it and you'll become rich. Does that sound familiar? We got a lot of that going on today. Isn't it funny that, that we claim that these things are some element of Christianity and Jesus never had anything to do with them? But somehow we have created this Savior, even, that, that is a very distorted image. Uh, you know, I think of other people. Uh, you know, Zacchaeus uh, was up in the tree. Uh, the woman caught in adultery in, in her worst circumstance, John chapter 8. Uh, the men, of course, bring her in and cast her down in front of Jesus and to this day, we don't know where the man was who was an equal sin. But, oh, no, let's throw the woman in here. Jesus says to her, woman, is there no one left to accuse you? Because they all went away when Jesus confronted their self-righteousness. He said, neither do I. Go and leave your life of sin. So the message was for everybody. And sometimes we, we, can, we can feel like, well, the message is for middle-class America. The message is for this kind of person. But one thing for sure, it's not for that kind of person. Rich people are not interested in spiritual things. Who told you that? Who told you that wealthy people don't have a heart that is worthy of the message of Jesus Christ? We say, well, you know, um, people are so busy. Families with kids, they're not interested. They're, they're too busy. I'm glad we have families with kids here today, aren't you? But you know what? People are interested. The thing is, we have to reach out to them and give them an opportunity. Everyone deserves a chance. This is what Jesus tells us. This is not only what he tells us, it's what he showed us. He showed us by everyone that he contacted. They were worthy. They were a worthy person. They deserved a chance. Jesus gave his love equally to everyone with whom he he had contact. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior. No wonder Jesus is the way. You know, uh, we think about this idea of salvation. I, I was just reflecting earlier. About It's been about two weeks now. One of our outdoorsmen uh, at Impact, um, his name is Terry, um, and he's well-known around, around campus. You know, he... Uh, was homeless. That's what we call our homeless ministry. We call it the outdoorsman. It's a little, little nicer term, right? And, um, you know, Terry hadn't been feeling well. As a matter of fact, somebody found him uh, kind of curled up on the church property. He had come over from where he was, and, and uh, we, we went to get a medical attention, and, uh, you know, he was doing a lot better. He's kind of back in, uh, you know, good frame, cleaned up. He was going to meet with his family, and, uh, he just dropped dead right in front of the church. Just like that. Totally unexpected. He did not look like a candidate to drop dead. But you know, and, and, and the thing is, I, I want, I'm sure that because when we had a, a staff discussion, it was so apparent that Terry was as important as anyone in our congregation. Tears, uh, well wishes, 
just lists of how, how great Terry was and the things that, that we're, we're going to miss about Terry. And, and listen, I've traveled. I work with a lot of different churches. I, I am so grateful to belong to a church family that values every single soul. He didn't have anyone. We, we tracked down, just tracked down his mother, finally found her. He had no one. He dies in the street. But you know what? He's as important. And he is as worthy as anyone else around. That's our Savior. Jesus loves everyone. And everyone deserves that opportunity. And we have to remember that Jesus is the way. He's the solution. He's not only, uh, he not only enables us to, to be saved, but you know what else he enables us to do? Change. And become a better, uh, to become more Christ-like. To find peace and, and self-identity. Look in uh, John, while we're here, let's look in John chapter 12. That we uh, turn back and uh, just take a look here again. These are, I, I, and I would encourage you to go back and study these uh, uh, through your way. I'm sure you'll gain insights out of that, but I, I want to just point to this text for a few moments. In uh, verse 20, it says, there were some Greeks among those who went up to the worship at the festival they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, there's a lot in this passage, but, but I, I want to just, just say that, you know, Jesus, he not only loves us and cares about us, and, and wants us to have salvation. He wants us to have peace. He wants you and I to not be living a life of stress. You say, well, how does he provide that? Well, that's, that's a little bit of a, a challenge here, isn't it? Jesus said, whoever loves his life was going to lose it. You hate your life. Whoever hates his life in this world will find it. You know, don't we want to find out who we are? Have you ever asked yourself, who am I? You know, this is, a, this is an issue that many young people struggle with, and, and many older people as well. But, you know, when we talk about how can I find myself, how can I be a better person, how can I be healed of the sins that have damaged my life, Jesus has the answer. He has made a way, not just for our salvation. He has made a way to help you and I find wholeness and healing and peace. That's what he can provide because he is the way. He's the way to find these answers. And it is so incredible to think. Jesus, he not only gave everything up for me. He gave everything up to, to pay the price for our sins. But then he'll say, hey, and you know what? Just lose your life. Don't, don't try to control everything. Just follow me. And I will take care of you. I'll meet your every need. Just follow me. You know, we like to be in control of everything, don't we? I know nobody's going to go, amen, brother. But we do. We like to be in control of everything. And, and sometimes even with our Christianity, we want to be in control. We want to, yeah, okay, all right, let's see what we're going to do. Okay, I'm going to do this and read this and, and, and I'm going to, and, and you know, we like to just control everything. I, when I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a friend of mine um, uh, in, uh, in the first ministry I ever preached at was in a, a small town in Wisconsin, in central Wisconsin. And um, I was at church one day, and this guy came up, and he was talking to me, and he said, hey, you know, I've really wandered from the faith, and I want to get my life right. And I said, okay. And we, we talked. Uh, he came over. We studied. We prayed. We talked about him being restored to the body of Christ, and, and he had a very penitent heart, and, and boy, he just had a transformation. It was so incredible. And then he said, Tim, but I got to tell you something. You haven't met my wife yet. And this was not a compliment. 
I said, what do you mean? He said, well, man, my, uh, you know. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do if she comes through that door. I said, come on, bro. It can't be that bad. He goes, oh, no, it really is that bad. I said, no, no, no. Just tell her, you know, tell her to come. And, and so she came. She's a very nice person. It's, isn't it funny how sometimes the person you know at home is different from the person out in public? Oh, I see some nods here. Okay, good, right? But, you know, I mean, that's the truth. And, and, and the person she had been at home, when she came to the church, she was so, she was like, wow, happy people. I, 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 you know, she was a very uh, high-powered executive, and she's not used to being around happy people that enjoy their life and, and share good news and want to meet her and know her name. And, and she came up, she goes, Tim, I just, you know, look, I like all this Christianity stuff, but I just think Paul was a woman hater, and I just can't get over that. I said, okay, let's sit down and study. So we studied. And, you know, she said, no, uh, I, I'm, I was wrong. Paul's not a woman hater. She gave her life to Christ. It was so beautiful. When we were talking about her character, though, her and her husband and I, uh, Nathan said, you know, my wife is such a control. She used to be such a control freak. And uh, they told this story when she was pregnant, right? They go to the hospital, and they, they check in, and all of a sudden, uh, Karen goes into the bathroom and locks the door. And they're all looking at each other. Time's gone by. Karen? Another five minutes. Karen? And then all of a sudden, the door came open. And she stepped out and she said, I've made up my mind, I'm going to have this baby. <laughs> Think about that, right? Because she, she wanted to be in control of it, right? That's how controlling she, she, she wasn't going to let the baby come on its terms. I've decided I'm going to have this baby, right? That's just her way of coping. But she, she, we like to be in control. And what Jesus says is, hey, just, just die. Just die. Die and follow me, and I will take care of you. You'll be a whole person. You'll be the best version of yourself that you can ever imagine. And it's not going to be by looking at yourself and pasting things on and saying the right things and doing the right things. It will be because you have given up and surrendered and follow me. And, you know, that's when life is peaceful, happy, productive. Is because life is so unpredictable. But we know if we die to ourselves and follow him, he will take care of us of us. What a wonderful Savior. He's the way. He has the right to be the way. I want to finally, um, I, I'm probably going to do a part two next week on this, but uh, I want to also talk about how Jesus made a way to escape religion. Jesus was a religion killer. He came to his modern day and he just turned everything upside down and he would not allow he would not even, he, he advised his disciples to stay away from these religious people. They are bad news. But, you know, let me, let me just turn, turn with me here as a final thought to Matthew chapter 5. And um, in Matthew 5, look, look at how Jesus a, a enables us to be sure that we have the right kind of worship. And um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, you know, it's, it's, it's so incredible. You know, when we come to worship, the Lord doesn't just want us to come and sit down here and sing. We're family. We talked about that this morning. We prayed about that this morning, that we're family, and, and, and we care about each other. But if we're not careful, you know, church can become kind of cold, and everybody shuffles in and sits down, and everybody shuffles out. I think I told you, when I was a kid, we nicknamed our congregation the first church of the Frigidaire. It was cold, right? And everybody had to be proper. And, you know, and the thing is, that's when we start falling into religion. And we aren't above that. You know, we, I want to make this clear. This, is a, this study is for you and I. It's not for those people out there. They're not going to hear this. So it's not for them. It's for us. But if we're not careful, we can fall into this so, so easily, even though no one intends to, to fall into being self-righteous, right? But look at this. And, and by the way, I'm gonna, I'll do a lesson sometime called, I have to work on the title. 
but it's going to be called something like the most disobeyed scriptures that Christians refuse to follow. I got some attention from you there. Okay, we'll work on that. Now, this is, but, but what I'm about to share with you, look at how wonderful Jesus is because he wants to ensure that we not only come and sit together, he wants to ensure that we are brothers and sisters and family and we love each other, we respect each other. And here in Matthew 5, he's talking about issues of the heart. And he says, you know, uh, he talks about murder and he says, you know, if in your heart you're a murderer, you're a murderer. You're accountable for your thoughts. You're accountable for what goes on. But look at what he says in verse 23. Note this. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. You know, how, how do we ensure that we stay unified? A growing church has a lot of different people. We have a lot of different people in this congregation. We, we, are, we have just a wonderful group made up of all kinds of people, right? Everybody has a story. Everyone has a life. And yet, you know, if we're not careful... Even in our fellowship, Satan can get in and we start, you know, we, we start feeling divided and separate. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, if you're coming to worship, you're going to come put your gift on the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, stop. Leave that gift there. I don't want it. Go and be real. Go and be reconciled. Go and be humble. Go and love your brother or your sister. And when you get that straightened out, I'm ready to take your gift. Otherwise, no go. This is one of those passages that often just we read over and go, amen, and we don't follow it. This is why as a family, you know, we have such a, we have a joyful, happy congregation here. And if, you, if you're watching with us online... Um, I said we have a good, diverse group, and we have a happy church here, and, and we believe the Lord wants us to be happy. But even among a happy group, you know, things can get in the way, and that's why Jesus says, I don't want things to get in the way of my family. If you come to church, and you're getting ready to worship, and you know something's up, something's wrong between you and another brother or another sister, leave it, go, go get it right, and then come. I believe, as in general, that is the heart that we have. But the practice of this, I think, is super deficient in most churches. I don't know this congregation that well. I just know human nature. And human nature is that sometimes things get between us and other people, and we're like, eh, whatever. Eh, it'll, it'll work itself out. It doesn't really bother me. And it does bother you. And you do feel that way. And you may come and offer a gift, but it's not getting much above the ceiling. Because Jesus said, go be reconciled, then come offer the gift. That's how we keep from becoming religious people who shuffle in and shuffle out. That's how we, that's how we come to church. We feel free. We, we have no guilt. We, we, we have no shame. Because we can look around the, the, the auditorium and look at everybody. And we can love people. We can affirm them. Yes, we have differences. Yes, we have, may have a conflict here and there. But nothing keeps us from being reconciled to each other. Because Jesus has reconciled us to God. You say, Tim, that's unrealistic. I can't do that. I know it's unrealistic. And only Jesus can make a way. It is unrealistic. You can hardly get this many people in a room and stay very long without something going incredibly wrong. But in the kingdom of God, in God's family, Jesus has made a way for us to stay at peace with each other. And you say, well, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Jesus says, hey, just die. Die and follow me, and I'll take care of that. I don't know what you're going to say, but you're serving me. Fall to the ground and die and obey me. And when you serve and obey me, I'm with you and my Father will honor the one who serves me. Today, as we think about Jesus being a way maker, let's remember he's a way maker because he's the way. 
He is the way. He wants to provide salvation to everyone. And Jesus, ha Jesus was able to discern the hearts of men and women. You and I cannot. Therefore, I don't know whether a person is open to the gospel or not unless I share it. That's the only way I know. Even then, I don't know that I know, <laughs> right? Sometimes you share with people, they don't seem very interested, and boom, their heart's just in that place, and they're looking, they're looking for an answer. But all, let's also remember that Jesus is the way to peace and harmony and growing, developing, if you will, personally, but also keeping peace within the church. He is the way. You're not the way. I'm not the way. He's the way, and all he asks is that we follow and obey. Today, if you uh, have something on your heart, a special prayer request, if you're interested in learning more about how to become a Christian, um, I know that uh, we'll, we'll sing a song of invitation here. Uh, Brett's already announced it. And, and if you have a need specifically, please come forward. We're all family here. Don't have any hesitancy if there's something that you want to ask the church for prayers for or a step you want to take. But please do that as we stand together and sing.